Hey there, everybody. This is Gary from Constricted and Addicted. I would love to welcome my special guest for this video. Hello, welcome. My name is Abby Stone over at the Curly Haired Keeper. I'm so excited to be here with Gary today. I would like to tell you how honored I am to have Abby here as we are going to tell you what we believe the top five things are you should know before you purchase a reticulated python. Our discussion will be centered towards super dwarf reticulated pythons because that's what we own. Insert exhibit A. This is Aries, my 50% super dwarf reticulated python. And before we kick off this video, I would really like to give a shout out to US ARC. If you're not aware, US ARC has a lot of new things happening. For one, they have a new YouTube channel. If you are not already, please go subscribe to that US ARC official YouTube channel. It's really important, shows how big we are as a community and how much we are willing to work together to grow and learn and work with others who don't really understand what we do. US ARC is here, they got our backs. Go follow, show them some support. If you are not a member of US ARC, I strongly suggest that you get involved, whether it's by giving a donation, getting a $40 bronze membership, which gives you the newsletters that allow you to know what's going on within US ARC, the laws that they're up against, and giving us the information that we need so that we can help out. Plus it gives US ARC a voice. In addition, if you get that $40 bronze membership, you also get a really cool t-shirt. So even if you don't want the membership, just go buy a t-shirt, add a little extra for a donation, and it just really shows cohesiveness in the reptile community. Let's get right into the top five things that you should know before you purchase that retic. Topic number one, how big do they get? This is really dependent on genetics. Aries here is a 50% super dwarf reticulated python. He is mixed locality. Now getting a mixed locality isn't necessarily something I recommend because it's hard to gauge how big he will be as an adult. He is just about a year old right now. He's about four feet long and he's probably estimating here gonna get around eight to ten feet. I am 100% comfortable with that size and it just really depends on genetics. Again, with size, when it comes to super dwarfs, if you really want a better guarantee, a better idea of that final estimation as an adult, go through someone who knows the exact locality, knows the exact percentage of Superdorf in the snake you're looking at purchasing. Obviously any snake with a Superdorf, a certain amount of Superdorf in their genetics will be smaller than a mainland reticulated python. They also are sexually dimorphic, so males are going to stay smaller than females. Again, this is generally. It's not a 100% for sure all of the time. So do your research, choose wisely, make sure when you go get that tiny little reticulated python that you know, or at least have a really good estimation of how big they are going to get as an adult and you have the space to keep them. Temperament of a reticulated python. You know, I think in reality that it's gonna depend on two different things. It's gonna depend on the owner or the breeder that you get your snake from. It's also gonna depend on the animal a great deal. Uh, I have Cora out because Cora was one of the animals that I really had to work with to get her to where she is today and it's through consistency. I believe that if you're consistent with your animal on most occasions, you will have a puppy dog tame reticulated python at the end of the day. Uh, and what it took for me was 
15 minutes of consistent handling, trying to make sure that every time that handling session was ended, it was ended positively. A positive experience for myself and a positive experience for the animal. I want to share that uh, my very first super dwarf reticulated python was a 75% Kalatoa wild type and she was not very nice to be honest with you. She tolerated being handled but it wasn't, you could feel it. When you have an animal in your hands that is not really uh, enjoying the handling experience as much as you are, it, it, all, it makes me anxious, it makes me uncomfortable, and really all I want is that animal to enjoy the experience like I'm enjoying the experience. Uh, and, and back then when I had that 75% Kalatoa, I wasn't really educated on positive handling experience. So th there's another thing that will come into play, of course, and that is the age of the animal. Uh, if you get an animal that's a little older and has not been handled, it's probably going to be a little bit tougher to work with that animal. But if you work with that animal, I do believe that uh, consistency will pay off in the end. But like with Cora, when I got Cora, I was told by the breeder that he really never handled her other than for cleaning, uh, transporting, you know, between enclosures and so forth. So I, I did not understand what I was getting myself into when I got Cora, but I also knew that she was going to need some work. Uh, and it, what I did was uh, I took her and I handled her for every day, regardless of what happened. When I got her, she flew out of my hands. She struck at me. She struck at my wife. She bit my thumb. Uh, she, she was a handful when I first got her, but I did not give up on her. I really wanted this animal. I got to keep an eye on her because she will get into the light fixture. Uh, I really wanted this animal to be able to be handled uh, in a way that was positive for both myself and for her. And I, have, I had a friend of mine who was telling me, you know what, you're gonna end up selling her. And I, I didn't want that. So I was consistent in handling. I was consistent in uh, you know, just making sure that we had a positive experience. And I'll tell you what, I was dressed up with a leather jacket and gloves. For the first probably three, four weeks of handling her, and then finally, you know, I realized that she was craw crawling around on me, and she wasn't, you know, trying to bite me anymore. She wasn't striking anymore. There was a tolerance level that was happening between the both of us, and you know, eventually, this is what it's come to. Uh, her temperament is absolutely puppy dog tame. And what my experience, again, is, is through consistent handling. Uh, the temperament of reticulated pythons, uh, these are, in my opinion, the reticulated python probably has the best temperament of any snake you can own. Uh, the most personable animal you can own, uh, definitely the most inquisitive animal you can own, and in my opinion, I mean, they're smart. They know their owners, uh, but I, I believe that it takes firm consistency in working with this animal to get it to where it's at. Trust within me with the animal and trust within the animal to me. Uh, so um, I've also heard it said that you've really got to be careful with these animals too, because it's not if you get bit, it, it's when you get bit. And it's, it's important that when I'm handling her, I'm always watching her body movements. It's up to me to understand if she wants to be handled or not. And there are times when I have had an animal out and you can feel it's stiff, you can feel it's just a little bit herky-jerky, uh, you can tell that something is off. And if I continue to handle that animal and something happens, it's on me because I didn't read the animal. So just in my opinion, right? Like the reticulated python, and I've got four of them in my possession right now. These animals are absolutely the most wonderful puppy dog tame animals that you can own. 
And if you happen to get one that is not, you know, so uh, friendly when you get it, like I said, consistent working with these animals will pay off. You just got to be patient. And uh, again, I, I, I totally believe in the positive reinforcement of uh, the interaction with these animals. If you have one that's uh, bitey or uh, defensive or scared, that's what they really are is scared. Uh, you've got to be the one to show this animal that it doesn't have anything to be afraid of. As Gary said, temperament on these snakes is truly wonderful. They're so smart. And something that I want to add to that is the importance of training your snake your retic when you get them. I have Aries tap trained. They do tend to be food, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but they, they are very food motivated. And they will associate you with food if you don't train them properly. So doing something like tap training, which is simply taking a snake hook or your hand and literally just knocking on their enclosure before you enter it or open their get a front front opening closure for your retic. Highly recommend that as well. But do that little knock before you enter their enclosure and they will associate that knock without food. So you do this any time you go into their enclosure without food. When you go in with food, don't tap. But they'll associate that tap with you, like Aries now associates that tap with me opening his enclosure. And if he's feeling social, he'll ask to come out. He will put his head on my hand, he will crawl out of his enclosure on his own, and it's really cool to see their brain working in that way, and they, they truly are smart, so use that to your advantage. Tap train. It's awesome. If you need further information on tap training, there's lots of really good YouTube videos on how to accomplish this. Lots of people with a lot more experience than I have on tap training their snakes. But regardless of how you get that information, I do highly recommend tap training your snake just to disassociate yourself from that feeding response. The availability of the super dwarf or dwarf reticulated python. I have only been keeping these animals for roughly about nine months, uh, but I had been researching them for about a year before I finally purchased one. A friend of mine had turned me on to the super dwarf uh, reticulated python, and I was completely intrigued how one of these beautiful animals could be obtainable at a size that was completely manageable. I, I personally, I, I can't fathom owning a large constrictor that gets, you know, 15 plus feet long. Uh, that's, that's a little bit too large for me. But when I heard about the Super Dwarf, I really wanted to get uh, a little more information on them and see what they were all about. When I first started looking for the Super Dwarf reticulated python, there weren't many people, especially on Morph Market, that were making these animals available. If you go to Morph Market, you'll find the Reach Out Reptiles, who is probably the largest uh, breeder of the Super Dwarf reticulated pythons. I don't believe they have a, a, a Morph Market account. So you would see maybe a, a couple, three or four Super Dwarf reticulated pythons and, and some of these animals were just at outrageous prices. I, you know, at that point in time, you know, twenty-five hundred bucks, three thousand dollars for a fifty percent Kalatoa. I just thought, wow, that's that's a little bit untouchable. But I kept on looking and I kept on looking, and over uh, the time that I'd been searching, I actually saw more and more Super Dwarf fifty percent or better Kalatoas start showing up on Morph Market, uh, and then. I found out there were people that weren't even on Morph Market that were selling these animals. Some people that I found through social media uh, that I've gained friends with and all of a sudden the market just kind of opened up for me anyways as far as looking for these animals. One of the most important things when you're looking for, and I'm going to refer to the Super Dwarf because that's what I have, and this does go for the dwarf locality as well, but when you are looking for these animals, it's really, really important that you find a breeder that is uh, 
trustworthy, right? Like somebody who is, is giving you the correct information. I still, to this day, with the four super dwarf, actually five super dwarf retakes that I own, uh, I don't have any sort of paperwork uh, that says, hey, this is the lineage of this animal. And, and I might be wrong in saying this, but I believe Reach Out Reptiles is really the only breeder out there who might have a lineage chart that they include with every sale. But I have to go by, and I do go by, on what my breeder tells me. And one of the things that I have found is to trust a particular breeder. For me, that is New Shed Serpents. Uh, I have got a really good relationship with Chris over at New Shed Serpents, so I trust him and I trust that if he tells me that this animal right here is a 50% Kalatoa, then that's what she is. And over time, size is showing me that. She's coming on three years old. She's just about six feet long. She's, to me, she's like an over glorified corn snake. So uh, it's really, really interesting to me to see how these animals have evolved and how they've just grown in popularity when it comes to the availability of these animals. Uh, they're still, price ranges are kind of kind of weird, right? Like I've seen some 50% Kalatoas nowadays, I see them for $1,500. Uh, other, other times you could see a wild type 50% Kalatoa going for 2,500 bucks. So it's, it's kind of interesting to, to look out there, see what deals are available, and make sure you question the breeder about the lineage, uh, about the percentage, uh, because these things are extremely important when it comes to owning a super dwarf reticulated python. If you are really concerned about the size of these animals and not ending up with a snake that's gonna be 15 plus feet long, you really wanna know its lineage. Uh, these animals can be mixed with dwarf localities, and if you have dwarf locality mixed into your super dwarf, that can also increase its size. Genes will always play a factor on the size of your animal. So it's, it's very important that whenever you purchase a super dwarf reticulated python, that you contact the breeder, you ask the questions, ask about the lineage of the parents of the animal that they're selling. Remember that two animals with the percentage of super dwarf divided by two equal the offspring. So if you have two 50% Kalatoa, male and female, breeding together, its offspring will be 50% because you've got a 50% male and a 50% female, that's 100% divided by two. So it's important because if you end up going to breed this animal later and you don't have any paperwork to back up the lineage uh, or the percentage of your animal, you could be muddying waters. You could be uh, breeding an animal that may not be uh, the percentage of the super dwarf that somebody is claiming that it is. So it's important, do your homework, look on Morph Market. If you're ever in doubt, trust Reach Out Reptiles. Uh, these guys are amazing when it comes to super dwarf reticulated pythons. I have five reticulated uh, pythons, super dwarf, and three of them have come from New Shed Serpents. I trust Chris. Chris has been always fair and, and more than fair. He's been, he's been s above board with me and uh, just a great guy to work with. And when I have somebody like that, uh, it makes it easier for me to go back. And when I wanna make another purchase, I go back to him and I see what he's got. He offers what he has to me. He tells me exactly what's going on with that animal. And then I make an informed decision if that's an animal that I wanna add to my collection. And being that I've now added three animals from Chris, uh, to my to my collection, uh, to me, I, I I stand behind Chris and say that guy is a is a stand up breeder. He's got great animals. Uh, but do your homework. Look out there. Uh, if you see an animal that has super dwarf but unknown locality, ask questions about it. See if they have any idea of what that locality is, so that if you do go to breed later, at least you can list what what the uh, locality is. Uh, but today. The availability of a super dwarf reticulated python is so much more than what it was before. So again, do your homework, look around, because there is a super dwarf reticulated python out there for you.
piggyback really quick on what Gary was talking about for availability, this is just another reason to support US ARC. Double check in your state and make sure that there's no rules and regulations in your state or the city that you live that prohibits the keeping of reticulated pythons. They are a highly monitored species on a government level. So just keep an eye out, make sure you're not breaking any laws by purchasing a reticulated python. US ARC really helps us to fight for our rights to be able to keep beautiful animals like this, especially when those rules and regulations are so overreaching. Moving on to topic number five, what is it like to keep and care for these wonderful animals? One, they are curious. They move around a lot. So in my opinion, the enclosure size needs to be pretty big. His is admittedly a little too small for his size at the moment. He's in a temporary quarantine enclosure. He will be getting a much bigger enclosure in the very near future, but they love to explore. They also love, at least Aries anyway, I have found, love to get out of their enclosure. He comes out on his own, I believe I mentioned that before, and he'll just hang for a good two hours and get exercise, explore his surroundings, explore his environment. They're not a snake you can just wrap around and wears a scarf while you watch a movie. <laughs> They're a little too busy for that. They take a little bit more interaction and I feel like a little more awareness as you're handling them. You are so clumsy sometimes, cute boy. However, it's really amazing to see their intelligence shine through. You can see their eyes moving as they are checking out their environment and keeping an eye on where you are it's, it's really cool to see. Highly recommend if you love interacting with your animals at this level. If you're looking for a couch potato snake, retics are not for you. Another thing to keep in mind as far as their care goes, a lot of time and effort obviously goes into giving them enrichment that they like and need, but also these guys like to make a mess. So if you have enrichment in their enclosure, I guarantee you they will poop on it at some point. They have a much higher metabolism than other snakes like my boas. My boas will poop maybe once a week. He goes to the bathroom almost every single day. So that means cleaning the enclosure, making sure everything's sanitary every single day. For me, that's wonderful. I love caring for my animals. I love taking things out, cleaning them, rearranging them for him, and watching him go back in and explore and check things out. If you want something a little more low maintenance, don't get a retic, because you're gonna be cleaning a lot. Again, huge thank you to Gary for doing this collab with me. Gary has a lot more experience in both length of time keeping reticulated pythons and just the number of snakes that he actually keeps. So feeling truly honored to share this screen time with him. So thank you again, Gary. Thank you everyone for taking the time to watch. If anything that we said convinced you to either get a reticulated python or decide not to, let us know in the comments if you have other things that you would have suggested for our top five, what to consider when getting a reticulated python, comment those below too. As always, don't forget to live life with brave curiosity and I will see you next time. Bye.